Anyone who knows me has doubtless heard of my obsession with the 1991 classic Point Break. If you haven't seen it yet, go ahead and stop watching this video because A, spoilers, and B, I do not even want to associate with anyone who hasn't seen it. That's how important this movie is to me. Everything from the dialogue to the plot rhythm up to the early 90s SoCal beach setting is so familiar, so comforting to me, that I used to keep a copy of this movie on every single device I owned, just in case. Now, the amount that I watch this movie makes my HBO Max subscription worth it alone. But yeah, watch it before you watch this. 1991's Point Break is an action heist film featuring quintessential performances by Keanu Reeves, Patrick Swayze, Gary Busey, and Lori Petty, all made possible by the visionary direction of Catherine Bigelow. This was a full 17 years before she became the first woman to win Best Director for The Hurt Locker, and I don't think it's a reach to say that it's exactly her critical and balanced approach to creating in the testosterone-dominated action film industry that gives her movies the emotional weight to affect audiences the way Point Break and The Hurt Locker and Near Dark and Zero Dark Thirty and so on have affected me. I don't even think it's a big stretch to say that Point Break is actually an expertly camouflaged lampoon of all the machismo rampant in this genre. There's too much testosterone here. Considering the market at the time, and 90s action movies were certainly a peak of hyper-masculine, extreme spectacle action films, this movie somehow manages to outdo them all while simultaneously shining a blinding spotlight on exactly the callous, reckless absurdity of it all. In fact, here's a smash cut of all the groundbreaking shots in Point Break that still influence the action genre to this day, just to get it out of my system. But that's not what this video is about. This video is about one villainous scene, specifically the final bank robbery. Real spoilers start here. If you didn't already know, the premise of the movie is that Johnny Utah, Keanu Reeves, is a fresh Quantico graduate, a rookie FBI agent on his first case for bank robbery in LA. The, the bank, bank robbers he is after, the ex-presidents, are in fact a gang of surfers, led by Patrick Swayze's Bodhi. The first two acts of the movie are essentially about the bromantic entanglement that draws these two together before they ultimately clash, are forced to reckon with who the other actually is, and have to figure out how to deal with these conflicting emotions. Okay, so I'm starting to hear why this movie has been accused of having homoerotic undertones. Fair enough, but that is also not what my video is about. It's about that final bank robbery, and oh yeah, you better believe there's more than one. Let me explain. The pacing of this film, well, it's just another thing I nerd out about, but the way the action swells and crashes in a series of incrementally more intense and higher stake climaxes, each threatening to pull both characters and viewers under, it's a perfect metaphor for the ocean, right? I don't know anything about surfing that I didn't learn from this movie, but I did grow up on the beach, and I'm fairly confident saying that the climaxes in this film are like waves in a set. And, okay, wait, wait, wait. Waves, well, they typically break in sets of 3 to 15, with the first wave being the smallest and the consequent waves getting bigger and bigger. And you can feel the pattern of that swell and break in the action of this movie. 
The first one is where Utah tries surfing that first wave and he literally almost drowns beneath it and the tone for the rest of the movie is perfectly set. It's only through learning to accept the ocean that he's even able to make it to the bigger wave, both literal and plot waves. Just feel what the wave is doing, then accept its energy, get in sync, and then charge with it. So the scene we're looking at, the villainous scene, the one where Bodhi and his gang have blackmailed Utah into robbing one final bank with them, that is the big wave of the set. The first two bank robberies, those were just warm up for this one. And like all waves, they break and crash. For our characters, that means the shit hits the fan. Look right here, and you can see the exact moment where Bodhi breaks bad, crossing the line from carefree, albeit reckless surfer, to full-blown homicidal maniac. But since the strength of the story and the implication of this specific moment rely so heavily on the characters and their relationships, we have to understand those to truly understand what we're seeing play out on Swayze's face in that moment. The film starts by introducing us to the two main characters, Swayze's Bodhi and Reeves' Utah. With an opening credit scene that still gives me chills, we see that Bodhi is singularly engaged in surfing, and that's it. It's literally everything to, for, and about him. Utah, on the other hand, is shown scoring a perfect score on a gun shooting test thingy. And likewise, we learn everything we need to know about him. He is methodical, obsessed, and a real blue flame special, aren't you, son? Young, dumb, and full of calm. I know. And for most of the movie, that's all we see of Utah. He's some quarterback punk. You're a pit bull. You didn't hesitate, and they didn't back you down and in. You had this intense sort of scowl of concentration on your face, like... You're doing all this for a school project or something. I wouldn't be surprised to learn that he didn't have any other hobbies before surfing, and we're certainly never given any sign that he enjoys doing anything besides being an FBI agent and catching bad guys. I am an FBI agent! When we get to meet his older, experienced partner, Angelo Pappas, he too bemoans this youthful zeal. Okay, hot shot. You want to nail the bank robbers and be a big hero? Definitely. Ah, yes. Gary Busey as Angelo Pappas. Say what you will about Busey as a human and an actor, but in this role, he is perfect. Sure, he suffered a personality-altering brain injury three years before this film's release, but by all appearances, he has embraced it and even leaned into it, so I feel no guilt in relishing the very, very uh, unique energy he brings to his characters. So Pappas... Utah's begrudging partner has been around the block, and when we first meet him, he is clearly worn out and tired of the bureaucracy of his job. However, it is clear that he fundamentally understands and cares about the work and the city. Man, LA has changed a lot during that time. The air got dirty and the sex got clean. Uh -huh. So although Utah's youthful zeal initially grates on him, he eventually comes around with another line that was decades ahead of its time, but whose impact continues nevertheless. You mad? Realizing that Utah won't give up, he throws him a bone, his lead on the case. The dead presidents are surfers, robbing banks three months a year in the summer, and then traveling where the waves are with their ill-gotten gains. And this is where Tyler comes in. Lori Petty's Tyler makes all the manic pixie dream girls before or since pale in comparison, primarily because she is not that. In this film, she is the voice of reason, the only one with any real emotional intelligence, and the one who foresees exactly all the shit the dumb boys are going to get themselves into. What are you talking about? You got the kamikaze look, Johnny. I've seen it. Lord, you can smell it a mile away. He'll take you to the edge. Past. She wouldn't pass the Bechdel test, but she still feels like a real, cognizant, and independent female character. She is manipulated into teaching Utah surf, and even that manipulation has consequences for him later in that film. You lied to me! But in the meantime, she introduces him to Bodhi, and even though it's heavily implied that she has had relations with both Bodhi and Utah, this is never a point of contention between any of them, nor is it used to pass any judgment on Tyler's character whatsoever. It's almost like she's a whole human person who's allowed to love and sleep with whoever she wants. I taught in that tree. I like it. The connection shared between the three of them, 
and it really does seem to be the genuine connection and not petty jealousy between the triangle, is pivotal in establishing Bodhi's turn to villainy. Do that, man. I can never hold a knife to Tyler's throat. She was my woman. We shared time. And now that we've established the characters, we can begin to set the scene, that one villainous scene. So Bodhi, Roach, Gromit, and Nathaniel, aka the ex-presidents, had just barely made a narrow escape from FBI agents Utah and Pappas, and they're starting to get scared. But Bodhi has a perspective that he trusts will keep them safe. This was never about money for us. It was about us against the system. That system that kills the human spirit. We stand for something. To those dead souls inching along the freeways in their metal coffins, we show them that the human spirit is still alive. Utah has found his humanity. Even obscured by a goofy Reagan mask, Swayze's dreamy blue eyes alone were enough to stir up Utah's connection to Bodhi and stayed his hand in that iconic emptying the clip into the sky scene. Armed with this knowledge, Bodhi prepares for the next scene with a look in his eyes that says he has, with 100% certainty, found the one thing Johnny Utah cares more about than getting his man. So you trust me? The love he has for the people around him. Okay. Then don't worry about this guy. I know exactly what to do with him. And that's because the first half of the film did his job. Even though we, the audience, knew the identity of the dead presidents as soon as they were introduced, Bodhi is presented in such a way that we forgive and understand Utah, not only for befriending him, but also for staying ignorant to his role in the robberies. Bodhi is charismatic, confident, spiritual, romantic, and empathetic to the end. He certainly doesn't have any of the motivations or characteristics someone like Utah would expect of a master bank robber. Hey, you're not going to start chanting or anything, are you? <laughs> I might. <laughs> but this isn't the Fast and the Furious, and there's no happy ending or La Familia here. So the morning after being made, the surfers surprise Utah at his house, and just as Bodhi predicted, their connection is enough to convince Utah to skydive with them. Never mind that they are both aware of the other's vocation, nor that Utah is injured. They're almost able to forget the impasse they should be at, and they go skydiving. And for a moment in the sky, everything is almost back to normal. But back on the ground, reality quickly catches up. Bodhi has had Rosie, a sociopathic goon associated with the surfers, kidnap Tyler as insurance. And here we start to see the dark side of their bromance. Bodhi believes he has found Utah's weakness, but in fact, he has found the one person crazy enough to run right over the edge with him. It's a small price to pay for someone who loves you. And as sickening as the plan is, I don't believe Bodhi has villainous intent yet. He has simply lost touch with the consensual reality and genuinely believes that Utah will acquiesce when faced with the active threat to Tyler and the implied threat to Bodhi. I can't do this. Sure you can. Who knows, you might like it. He's almost correct, but the next scene, yes, the final bank robbery, changes everything. The scene starts with this long cut in which everything, even the rubber masks, are manipulated perfectly. Everybody freeze! <laughs> That's about where the perfection ends. Bodhi is starting to realize that Utah is not as scared as he hoped, and that is, in a way, what pushes him over the edge. To put the real fear of God into Utah, he sends Nixon and LBJ to the vault, and the cracks start showing. Dick, Dick, go to the vault. Bodhi's getting greedy, breaking his own rules, and even his own team is starting to project fear. Why we go to the vault? We never go to the vault. The very thing he warned Utah against in the van ride over. If you scare them and get them peeing down their leg, they submit. Yet if you project weakness, you draw aggression, that's how people get hurt. Ironically, it's just that projected weakness and the extra time in the vault which provide an off-duty cop the opportunity he needs to convince the bank security guard to stand up and be a hero. And the guns start firing. Utah announces himself as an undercover agent, and in the chaos, LBJ, aka Gromit, is shot in the throat. And that's the moment. That's the moment that Bodhi snaps. As he pulls off his Reagan mask, you can see that he's finally realized the truth that actually several things are stronger than La Familia, namely dogma and testosterone. The game is over now and we see the malicious intent in his eyes that brands him a true villain. He kills the cop without hesitation and struggles with the dying grommet. 
He processes what's happened and, in his delusional state, comes to the conclusion that blame for everything, up to and including Gromit's death, falls squarely on Utah's shoulders. He says all of that in the clearest way possible. A pistol whip. The truth, of course, is that they drove each other to this, exactly as Tyler predicted. He'll take you to the edge. Past. But for the rest of the movie, Bodie is operating from this delusional, villainous frame. It almost hurts to see the rest of the movie play out. The two take emotional pot shots at each other the way only true bros could. I know it's hard for you, Johnny. I know you want me so bad it's like ass in your mouth. But not this time. Bodie remembers and acknowledges Utah's old injury. And they, again, huh? and they bond over surfing until the very end. Still surfing? Every day. The love, respect, and empathy they have for each other is still there, but the line has been drawn in the sand. Bodie has to be free. You know, there's no way I can handle a cage, man. Utah has to get his man. You gotta go down! Neither one can quit, and they can't both win the game. But the saddest truth is, they have already both lost. When Utah catches up to Bodie at the end of the film, Bodie has lost his freedom on the lamb, and his family are all dead. Cross the line, and people trusted you, and they died. Yeah, it went bad. It went real bad. Life sure has a sick sense of humor, doesn't it? Utah, on the other hand, got his partner killed, and the target of his first and only investigation as an FBI agent turned out to be his best friend. So in the ultimate symbolic act, the climactic last wave in the set, Bodhi and Utah both give their lives to the sea. If you want the ultimate, you gotta be willing to pay the ultimate price. It's not tragic to die doing what you love. Yeah. Bodhi literally kamikazes into the biggest surf the world has ever seen, and Utah throws away the badge that was his identity until surfing. In the end, Bodhi wasn't really a villain. Utah wasn't really a hero. Life isn't that black and white, and that's the realization Utah has to live with. Big wave riding, macho assholes with a death wish.